You're listening to On Shifting Ground from World Affairs and KQED. I'm Ray Suarez. Over a decade ago, when Dr. Frank Mugisha opened a local Ugandan newspaper, he found his name and picture printed alongside 100 other members of Uganda's gay community. The article's tagline read, Hang Them. Frank says being gay in Uganda used to be an unremarkable thing. It was tolerated, ignored, but never quite fully accepted. And then, suddenly, it became life-threatening. In May 2023, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni enacted one of the harshest anti-LGBT plus laws in the world, making homosexuality punishable by death. President Museveni equates gay rights with Western imperialism in Africa, but activists like Dr. Mugisha claim the real American import is anti-gay hysteria, brought to Uganda by American Christian evangelicals. Joining me now is human rights activist and executive director of SMUG, Sexual Minorities Uganda, which advocates for the protection of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Ugandans. Dr. Frank Mugisha, welcome to On Shifting Ground. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us what's going on lately in Uganda. We get reports that parliament, other national figures have turned up the pressure on sexual minorities, that they have heightened the legal penalties. Is it a more dangerous place to be gay? It has become extremely dangerous to be an LGBTQ plus person in Uganda over the years. This is not the first time we are seeing extreme draconian legislation come up. It first came up in 2009, and we were able to remove it in 2014. And then we had, a, I would call it a grace period for about five years. Recently, the law was reintroduced. But prior to the law being introduced, we had extreme anti-gay and anti-gender activists systematically working with extreme radical evangelical Christians from America to erase the existence of an LGBT plus person. I was singled out. I faced so many criminal charges that were frivolous, of course, and I couldn't leave my house, literally. I had to stay, to be put in a safe space. I was under surveillance by almost every entity, security entity in Uganda. And that very year, my organization, which is the leading and largest network for LGBT plus persons, was shut down by the government because of this propaganda that was being peddled by extreme Christians. Help us understand what the law says now, what the state of play is. So the law was introduced in 2003. This law would criminalize an LGBT plus person to life in prison. This law would criminalize me being on a podcast like this with you in Uganda. Normalization of homosexuality, just simply saying that it is okay to be gay would send you to prison. Uh, Media houses talking about homosexuality that would be criminalized. Landlords providing housing for LGBT plus persons would be criminalized. Catholic priests, and healthy workers, if an LGBT person confides in them about their sexuality, they have to report them to the authorities. This law introduces death penalty. Any person who is a repeated offender, as they call it, serial offender under this law, would be executed. Any person who engages in sexual acts with a person under age, with a person living with disability, or if any of the people engaging in same-sex acts are living with HIV and AIDS, would be sentenced to death. Children under the age of 18, if they were rumored in school or by their family that they are LGBTQ plus persons, they would be sent to jail for three years. So this law is very extreme and really, really draconian. It was the first ever piece of legislation to be introduced in the Ugandan parliament, and it was only in the parliament for nine days. 
it was debated for the first and second reading and passed into law in two hours. And when it was introduced in our parliament, it wasn't as extreme as it left. That is why I gave you the background of Ugandans being radicalized. The members of parliament increased the penalties. The death penalty was introduced on the floor of parliament. Extreme punishments were introduced by the floor of parliament. Some members of parliament were saying that by simply someone identifying as LGBT person, they should be castrated or they should be hung. What has this done to members of sexual minorities? Once you understand yourself, you understand who you are, once you're out to yourself, if it's this dangerous to just live normally in your community, how do you manage to stay out of jail, out of attention, out of uh, interference from police, from the snooping of local people, day to day, what's happened to life for people who are members of these various sexual minorities? There is no social life for LGBTQ plus persons in Uganda. The socializing like local bars, house parties, people meeting up on social media, all that, can't happen anymore because people are afraid. Majority of LGBT plus Ugandans have gone back in the closet because they are worried of getting exposed. Being exposed, we have notorious media in Uganda that exposes LGBT plus persons. And when people get exposed, they lose jobs. They are disowned by their families. They lose friends. Some end up in jail. So for many Ugandans who are LGBT plus persons, they stay isolated. But what that has done is the trauma it has caused the LGBT plus community. We've documented so many cases of mental health and trauma within the community. And the other challenge is that there's so much blackmail and extortion from the law enforcement. Law enforcement will go on dating apps and pretend and then get people and then blackmail and extort money from them. Or they will use law enforcement to infiltrate the LGBT plus community and then blackmail and extort money. So majority of the people who are so scared and have gone back into the closet, there are still ways they are being violated by law enforcement and some very transphobic and homophobic people. In this latest iteration, have there been tests of the law? Has it been applied? Are there people being arrested for being gay? Are there people being sentenced once they're tried? The law has been implemented, yes. It was passed and signed into law in June this year, 2023. Between the time when the debate of the law started in our parliament and now, we have documented more than 300 cases of violations. And most of these cases are non-state actors. So the law is being implemented highly by the public. People are getting evicted from their homes. People are getting harassed and beaten as they are going on to, with day to their lives. But law enforcement has also implemented this legislation. I spoke about blackmail and extortion. We have four cases under prosecution at this moment including one case of an individual who is on the death penalty. At the outset of our conversation, you mentioned that a lot of this was brought along, intensified by evangelical Christians from the United States. Tell me more about that. The history of Uganda as a country I wouldn't say it was very accepting of homosexuality, but people would live in peace and LGBTQ plus persons were frowned upon. Yes, they had names. I came out at a very early age of about 14. I didn't face so much rejection from family, from society as a 14 year old boy would, what would happen to a 14 year old boy now if they were to come out. The language that is being used to radicalize Ugandans against the LGBT plus persons is simply not Ugandan language. For instance, they say we recruit young children into homosexuality. And Uganda is a country 
that is about 50% under the age of 16. Everyone cares about young people. They say that homosexuality is not Ugandan, it is Western. There has been so much history about LGBT plus persons existing in Uganda, including in our own local languages. So ironically, they also use religion, which is foreign to Uganda, to promote all these draconian ideas and ideologies. And to be honest, the whole movement is about getting the country to be very conservative because they are fighting abortion, they are fighting women's rights and anything around teenage sexuality. So we are seeing that these kind of new ideologies in our society have never existed in Uganda. We've just started seeing this now. And this is theoretically, but visibly, American evangelicals have traveled and gone to Uganda and put their fingerprints on these draconian legislations. Most recently, the president of uh, Family Watch International, Sharon Slater, was in Uganda, meeting up with legislators, meeting up with public officials, and encouraging that in this legislation, they should include rehabilitation, which is conversion therapy. In fact, promising that she wants to build a state-of-the-art facility where LGBT persons who have been forced into homosexuality can go to be rehabilitated. My organization, Sexual Minorities Uganda, we collected evidence where we took to court one of the American evangelicals called Scott Lively here in the US in Massachusetts using the Alien Tort Statute. And we provided a lot of evidence, volumes of emails and correspondences workshops that he was conducting in Uganda, demonizing us with all this misinformation and disinformation about the LGBT plus community in Uganda. So the information is very clear. And most recently, we are also getting information that these American extreme evangelicals are into this alliance with Russia, promote family values in Africa. So we're seeing them partnering up with some Russian groups again in Africa. I'm not a scientist. I'm not even a sociologist. But the idea that there are only gay people in Uganda because it's an idea that came from the West is, on its face, ridiculous. There are gay people everywhere, and there have been all the time. But this seems to fit in with, let's call it a defensiveness. A lot of African countries, in asserting their own cultural centrality, let's say. Let's get back to the basics of who we are as a people. Let's reject foreign ideologies and foreign influences. This would fall very comfortably into that ideological space where you say, well, we want to be who we were authentically as a people before colonization, before invasion, before domination by outside forces. Is this part of a a nationalist project in addition to simply being homophobic? It is. You clearly describe it as a nationalistic project, but also what we're seeing now, especially coming from the politicians, it is also popularism. They believe that by being homophobic and being anti-Western, then you're going to be popular on the ground in Africa. And these extreme... Christians who are coming to Africa, they are using that ideology of knowing that Africans want to be independent and be assertive and talk about sovereignty. And so they are using anything that could resonate with the thinking that anything Western, reject it. And so they are saying homosexuality is Western, reject it. Because the majority of Western countries have already accepted LGBT plus persons. But then I would say that and I've said this many times when I'm traveling, that if we don't look at the momentum in how anti-gay and anti-trans propaganda is growing, even in the West, we risk losing all the gains that have been created. Because once these groups get comfortable in Africa, they start coming back here and using the same data and statistics and saying we were able to do this in Africa and we we're able to change people and they bring it back here because they are convincing Africans and they are saying that there are people in the West who have been indoctrinated into homosexuality and they can't get out. And the reason we want Africa, 
we don't want you to be in that position. You should speak out now. If you accept homosexuality, that is neocolonialism. They're going to come up with more. They're going to take away more. They're going to take away your, your gold, your land, your oil, and all the rest. As a practical matter, if you're deeply closeted, if you feel like you're being hunted, if you feel like people down the street might be spying on you or ready to turn you into the police, can you leave the country? I know it's hard to leave your family, the place you're from, everything you know, but in order to save your own life and maybe save your own sanity, can you go somewhere else? We have documented hundreds of LGBTQ plus persons who have fled the country. Fleeing discrimination from Africa is not easy because you can't really get into a safe country. You need a visa, you need a plane ticket. And majority of LGBT plus persons, as you can imagine, because of discrimination, they can't afford, or they won't be able to prove to the embassies and missions in the country to get a visa. And there is one pathway, which is uh, the UNHCR, and it is very slow. And also it has so many cases. So expediting LGB plus issues has been hard, but also people have to find themselves in the space where the UNHCR is. For example, you cannot claim asylum or refugee status in your own country. You have to go to another country. So many LGBT plus persons have fled to Kenya. The Ugandans have fled to Kenya, which is equally dangerous. So we've been dealing with so many cases of violence towards LGBT plus persons in the refugee camps in Kenya as well. I mean, there are some who have been able to flee and come to countries that are more accepting. And when they reach there, definitely we try to provide as much evidence to support their claims as possible so that they can settle. But majority, many Ugandans, many Ugandans reach out every day. They want to leave their country, they want to flee. Because you find yourself in a corner. I mean, mentally, you're worried, paranoid, and then something's physically, you get arrested, you get attacked, and then it's a constant fear all the time. So many Ugandans want to flee. Every lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual person comes from a family, has a mother and a father, has sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles. Extended family is important in a lot of cultures around the world, certainly in Africa is no exception. How come loving your own nephew, your own niece, your own brother, hasn't been enough to push back on legislation that doesn't just discourage, but makes miserable and dangerous the lives of the people who are the members of our own family. Yeah, uh, I mean, our extended family in Africa is key. I know friends who have told me I would rather go to prison than get exposed in the media because they are worried about their families finding out about their sexuality. They would rather go to prison as long as no one knows about it than being exposed in the media and their families will know and this on them and disinherit them or they are not allowed in any family functions anymore. That's how much family means a lot to people. But like I mentioned, the Christian groups have indoctrinated Ugandans into this fear of LGBT plus persons that you have families, families taking their own, kidnapping their children and taking them to mental institutions to treat them of mental illness because they have come out gay. Okay. Your family is taking their own sons and daughters to police and imprisoning them. Your family is forcing their own daughters into sexual acts with their family members to correct them because they have come out as lesbians. So the indoctrination has been too much that there is so much resistance. In fact, the biggest fear for many LGBT plus persons is coming out to families. The biggest percentage of LGBTQ plus Ugandans are living double lives. I am sometimes, I wouldn't say shocked, but surprised by the contacts I get for people who need my help. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, you too. Like, so there are so many people. 
they are friends of mine who I know who are living double lives and struggling, who have been in and out of marriages, but they can't say why. I know friends of mine who have ended up getting complications with their health mentally and other because of forcing themselves into marriages. I know some people who will, when it's time to show up for family events, they will have to find a friend who is a different sex just to escort them if they are going to meet their family. So where do we go from here? You've been at this a long time. It's been the struggle of your adult life. You founded Icebreakers in 2004. Here we are almost 20 years later, and things have only gotten worse for gay people in Uganda. I mean, my hope is in the resilience of the LGBTQ plus community. And the fact that at this moment I have inroads supporting people. When I just started Icebreakers, my only support LGBT persons was providing them, talking to someone and encouraging them to be who they are and supporting people to coming out and providing spaces, a space where a few, five, six people can meet up and be who they are. But now I have a voice that can speak up, that I've used strongly to advocate and create a few changes in Uganda. And then I also, I'm able to support people who are vulnerable. For example, people who need to be rescued from prisons. During COVID, I had to support people with relief, providing food, providing mental health support, to many LGBT plus persons. And then of course, challenging legislations like I'm doing, challenging this legislation in Uganda at this moment. So that's where my hope is. And the community is resilient. However much we face all this, we always stay strong. We always stay strong. Yeah, but you've got a platform, as you mentioned. You've got a public profile. You are out. Aren't you also exposed and in danger all the time now? Yes, I am. That's why when I was singled out by these anti gay and anti gender groups, it was very difficult for me. I almost fled the country because I was a target of not only arrest, but I was receiving so many death threats on my life. I had to turn my mobile phone off because I was getting the threats constantly on my phone. So I'm a target of violence, a target of arrest. If they want anyone to blame for anything in Uganda, it's me. They even blamed me for a concert that I wasn't organizing at some point. And I wanted me arrested for a concert, which they say this was an LGBT plus concert because it's one of the biggest concerts that happens in Uganda and the authorities wanted to arrest me and I had no idea about this concert. They blamed me for COVID, they blamed me for all these things. So I'm a target and I'm always scapegoated for so many things in the country. But that's just it. Are you reconciled to the idea that at least for now, you can't have a normal life? You can't hold your boyfriend's hand. You can't go to a dance. You can't live the kind of unremarkable life that you'd be able to live right here where we're speaking in San Francisco. Are you looking at this for the long haul, that it may take years to turn around a whole society? Yes. I mean, if people ask me about my activism, I tell them it was a gradual process for me. It wasn't a decision that I made that said, I want to be an activist. If I had thought about it, that's how my life would be. I definitely would have said, no, that's not the path I want to take because for my whole teenage life and my life now, I can't do the things my age mates have been doing or are doing. I can't go to the club. I can't hold my boyfriend. I can't even have a boyfriend because my boyfriend, my partner had to flee the country because of being targeted as well. That's about 10 years ago. And I can't simply visit my family. I can't have friends if my friends are always labeled as homosexuals, even if they aren't homosexual. Some people don't even want to be friends with me because they feel like they would be outed or called homosexuals. So the life becomes really complicated. And it's true. I mean, I could work so hard 
at creating a safe space for the LGBTQ plus community in Uganda by removing the legislations and maybe changing a few policies. But changing the hearts and minds of Ugandans is going to take a very, very long time. Did you grow up in the church? Yes. Has this been hard for you? Have you had to rethink Jesus, the whole question of a loving community, the whole question of what it means to be a member of a congregation, to take communion, this must be really hard for a Christian person. Yes. I mean, as a young boy, it was very difficult for me because I had trust in family and trust in God. As raised as a Catholic, we were taught in the catechism, trust God even before family. And so I had my own engagement with God as a young person on so many aspects around my life. And in many, most times I was disappointed. And so I had my questioning time and I've come to a point in my life where I have reconciled that because I felt like it was mostly people who are presenting themselves in God's words and the image of God that were really hurting me and hurting the LGBT plus community. But my faith has remained strong. My faith has really stayed strong because I've reconciled that. I'm like, you know what? If then I'm supposed to lead this life and support people and be resilient, I still need to maintain my faith with God. And that has not changed. But when I was young, of course, I doubted. I was frustrated. I was annoyed. I used to wear a rosary, took it off, and I stopped going to church. I was an altar boy. I stopped doing that. So there are so many things. I mean, I made bets with God. I'm like, if I have good grades, are you going to do this for me? Are my friends going to like me back? Even as simple as saying, am I going to get a partner? So many things. This is the life I was leading every day with many challenges of discrimination. So every day I constantly made bets with God. Even if a priest said a scripture in the church that resonated with me, I would go and do it and practice that and say, let me see the outcome. Yeah, But now I am more informed about so many things. And for me, my faith really also helps me to keep moving. Frank Mugisha from Sexual Minorities in Uganda, SMUG. He's the executive director. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced by Sienna Barnes, Elise Minukian, and Andrew Stelzer. It was mixed and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is CEO of World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.